Hi everyone and welcome to chapter 41 which focuses on osmoregulation and excretion. Now before we go through the mechanisms of osmoregulation, it's first important to remind you what exactly does osmosis mean and the different situations it involves. So again, remember anytime you hear osmosis, that's the movement of water from high water to low water. Now this movement of water also depends on the solute concentration around that cell, okay, or around that membrane. So we mentioned three different possible conditions for that water movement. We mentioned what happens to a cell if it's in a hypertonic, so hyper means a lot of, like when you're hyper and you have a lot of energy. So hypertonic is a high salt environment around the cell. And what you see happens, remember, those cells lose water. So they shrivel up. Whereas the opposite is hypotonic, where you have low salt around that cell. And remember, we did a little memory trick of hypo, think hippo, because those cells will take in water and they'll start to swell up. They'll get big like a hippo, and then they might even burst. The last scenario is isotonic. And any of you hoping to go into the nursing or medical field, isotonic will be very important term for you to know because most buffers and solutions you want to use involving the body should be isotonic meaning that there is a balance. So the amount of water leaving the cell will equal the amount of water coming in. There's no major gradient, meaning no major difference between the amount of salt in the cell versus on the outside. Now, there's another term we're gonna cover, which is called osmoregulation. So if osmosis tells you about the movement of water based on water and salt concentrations, then that tells you that osmoregulation means that you are going to try and regulate that movement, those concentrations, which is basically a fancy way of saying osmoregulation is trying to keep water salt balance. Okay, it's a mechanism by which the cell will uh, maintain the water and solute or salt concentrations at desired levels. Now, there's two types of solutes when we say, you know, water solute concentrations. Solutes can either be electrolytes or non-electrolytes. So electrolytes, if you've ever heard of that, what do, you, what do you drink if you're drinking electrolytes? It's usually very salty, right? Like Gatorade, very salty taste. Because electrolytes are solutes that break down into ions when they are dissolved in water. And again, the big example of that is salt. If you put NaCl into water, it breaks down into its Na plus ions and its Cl minus ions, okay? The positive sodium, the negative chlorine ions, okay? So electrolytes are solutes that break down into ions when dissolved in water, whereas non-electrolytes, that's gonna be the opposite, right? That's going to be solutes that don't break down into ions when dissolved in water. And the big example of that is sugar. Okay, so when you think of electrolytes, know that the example is salt, whereas non-electrolytes, the example is sugar. And that makes sense because even though sugar will dissolve in water, it's not breaking down into any ions, which is why your body... What does your body do in terms of sugar? It breaks it down during cellular respiration. It's not that having that sugar in your body will instantly just dissolve it, break it down, right? You need special processes. So now the other point I wanna make with regard to osmoregulation is a lot of it is dependent on membranes, right? Because this is water or solutes moving back and forth across membranes. So when we talk about membranes of your body, we say that they're semi-permeable. And you've heard this term before when we talked about plasma membranes. Semi-permeable simply means that they are able to have things move back and forth across them, okay? They are permeable, which means permissive, allowing movement to certain, only certain types of solutes and water, not 
everything will be able to cross the membranes of the body. Okay, so that's what semi-permeable means. They only partially allow certain molecules to travel across them. Okay, now when you think of osmoregulation, it's basically achieved across many membranes within the body, but what you also have is the idea that excess or, you know, the remaining electrolytes and wastes are going to be transported to kidneys and excreted in order to help maintain osmotic balance, okay? Because you don't want a whole bunch of salts building up in your body. So that's going to be the second portion of this chapter. This lesson is focusing on not the entrance or movement of these, you know, electrolytes and waters, but rather the excretion thanks to the kidneys of the excess or the waste products, okay? Now keep in mind, you need osmoregulation in your body because you're constantly getting and, and moving water and nutrients with the environment because think about all the times you eat and drink throughout the day, okay? And you also constantly not only have the intake of water and electrolytes, but you constantly have excretion, meaning letting them out of your body as well in the form of sweat, urine, poop, any of that kind of stuff. Okay, so this chapter is very important to your everyday lives. And without a mechanism to really regulate that water salt balance, or if diseases kind of damage the, the mechanism, including your kidneys, then you can have very dangerous uh, consequences. If you think of chronic kidney disease and the need for dialysis, that's what happens when osmoregulation goes wrong in your body. Now, before we start focusing on uh, humans and the kidneys in terms of osmoregulation, I want to point out that there are a lot of different mechanisms that have evolved to, you know, basically handle the water salt balance in the bodies of organisms. There are two terms that you encounter uh, with regard to osmoregulation mechanisms. There are osmoregulators. And then there are osmoconformers, okay? Now, with osmoregulators, thinking of the, the first example that we have up there, these are organisms where you're basically going to have a different solute concentration in that organism versus their environment which means that that organism has to be able to adapt mechanisms to regulate their salt water balance, okay, with their environment. And fish, a lot of fish are osmoregulators, but they end up using different mechanisms depending on whether they're in fresh water or marine water. And again, marine water, that's going to be your salty waters, okay? So with osmoregulators, for instance, fish, you have first the option of marine environments. Well, we just said marine means high salt water, right? What do you know about cells or, or bodies in a high salt environment? That's hypertonic. That means that they're going to be losing a lot of water, right? They lose cells, lose water, shrivel up. So these fish are going to be losing a lot of water being in salty water. So what are they going to do in order to make up for that? they'll have to drink water, right? They have to drink water to try and take in water. And when they move, you know, around these, the, these locations where you have the, the high salt, they'll start to drink the seawater. So you're thinking, wait, why, you know, if they're in a salty water and they're trying to get water, the only water available to them is salt water. Won't that make things worse? Well, what these fish are able to do is they drink the seawater and then they excrete the excess salts through their gills and through their urine. Okay. Fun fact, fish do pee. So when you when you go out swimming into water, you know, you jump off into that nice, beautiful water, just know it's filled with tons of fish pee. Okay. So they they have to excrete their salt. Okay, so in a marine environment, what happens? It's high salt environment, so the fish loses water and has to drink 
seawater, which they then excrete the excess salts through their gills and urine. Whereas in fresh water, fresh water is not salty, it's low in salt. So what happens in low salt environments? You gain water, right? That's hypotonic, hypotonic, okay? So in those hypotonic environments where they're gaining a lot of water through their cells, these fish do not drink the water, okay? Instead, they pass a lot of very dilute urine. It's not gonna have a lot of salts because they wanna hold on to their, to, to whatever salt they have. And they basically achieve electrolyte balance by actively transporting salts through their gills, okay? So they're not gonna drink the water because they're already gaining a lot of water. And to try and balance that out, they'll take in salts and, and electrolytes through active transport through their gills. Whereas what did marine environment fish do? They lost salts through their gills. They excreted them out. So marine environment fish will take in, uh, sorry, will, will take in water and excrete salts from their gills whereas freshwater fish will not drink water and they will try and get salt from their gills, okay? The alternate to that, or the alternative, is to be an osmoconformer. This basically involves a lot of the marine invertebrates, so things like jellyfish, mussels, crabs, lobsters, scallops, starfish, any of those little kind of creatures, okay? And what osmoconformers do is they basically will have the same solute concentration in their body as their environment has, okay? So water will move in and out in an osmotic balance because it's as if they're isotonic with their environment. But the, by having the same osmotic balance with their environment, they don't have any mechanism if they end up in a changed environment, okay? So that means that osmoconformers, they're very highly restricted. They have to stay in the environment that they are specifically matched to, okay? So they won't be able to move to other environments. They don't have any mechanism to regulate their osmotic balance because they're naturally at the, the um, osmotic pressure for their particular environment and they can't leave that place. Now we keep mentioning water and electrolytes and their balance and their movement. I just want to kind of review some terms that we've touched upon already in previous lectures and relate it to the water and the electrolytes that we're talking about. Now when we say osmotic regulation and this movement of water and salts, Keep in mind that when water moves, it's moving through osmosis, which is an example of passive diffusion. And we've talked about passive diffusion before. That's when something goes from its high concentration to its low concentration. It's a natural movement. It's what things naturally want to do. There's no energy required. There's no special proteins uh, required. Whereas electrolytes, the way that they move during this process is either facilitated diffusion or active transport. So facilitative diffusion, what that means is they require these protein-based channels. So right here, this is a protein that will basically encourage the movement of that solute across a membrane. Now, it's still, because it's diffusion, it's from high concentration to low concentration and doesn't need energy. But the reason it's different from passive diffusion is that it requires a specific protein, which means, you know, certain, certain ions can pass through a membrane only at certain locations of that membrane. The alternative is active transport, and that is when an ion or solute is in a low to high concentration movement. And that will require energy because it's going against the natural gradient. Now, keep in mind the reason that electrolytes need facilitated diffusion or active transport is that if 
electrolyte ions could just passively diffuse across your membrane whenever they wanted, it would be impossible for the cells for your body to maintain specific concentrations of ions. So that's why you need the special mechanisms of facilitated diffusion and active transport to properly regulate electrolyte movement. Now, as we mentioned before, you're constantly getting and exchanging water and nutrients, solutes with the environment because of your food and water intake and because of excretion. And so osmoregulation, you need to have a way to, to rid the body of waste so that they're not building up, you know, toxic waste in your body, not building up crazy amounts of, of electrolytes and whatnot. The products of osmoregulation, the excretion products, if you think about it, nitrogenous wastes are the big product of catabolism in your body, in your cells. Okay? And by catabolism, again, remember, that means breaking things down, like that cat scratching apart that sofa. So when we say nitrogenous wastes are excretion products, they're a product of breaking down the amino acids and the nucleic acids in your, in your body, in your cells. And again, remember amino acids, we're talking about protein subunits, and nucleic acids, we're talking about things like DNA and RNA, and even ATP. So there are three types of nitrogenous wastes that are, can be excreted by organisms. There's ammonia, urea, and uric acid. And the difference between them is that ammonia, if, even if you think in your everyday life when you hear about ammonia, ammonia is highly toxic to your cells and your body. So you would need a lot of water to excrete that. Whereas urea is a slightly less toxic form compared to ammonia. And so that one can be excreted concentrated without being toxic to you. It's basically uh, the, the main form that you'll find for mammals. So for urea, I want you to circle star highlight urea and point out that this is the main form of nitrogenous wastes for mammals and that includes you. The last option is uric acid, and that one's not toxic at all, but it's also not soluble in water. So you can excrete even more concentrated than urea. But the problem with uric acid is that lots of energy are required to produce that. So you basically find that more in birds, like you see over here, okay? And that's why if you... <laughs> I, I, I know I'm going to say if you, we know we've all seen bird poop, especially on our windshields, uh, supposedly good luck. Um, but when you look at bird poop, you notice a lot of times it's very dried and stuck to your window. It's not as liquidy as you would expect because of, you know, the the concentrated, it's, it's very concentrated uric, uric acid in there. So when you think about the different organisms and what they're excreting, basically aquatic animals, so the example here being the fish, uh, aquatic animals can easily excrete ammonia because they're in watery surroundings. So that dilutes down the toxicity of that ammonia. Whereas ter terrestrial animals such as us, we've evolved special mechanisms you know, to, to handle our, our excretion waste. So urea is the best byproduct for us because it's basically low water loss, but also low energy loss, okay? Because we said it's, you know, we can excrete it concentrated because it's less toxic, but it also doesn't require much energy. Whereas uric acid, that requires a lot of energy, but they, the, the metabolisms of things like birds and reptiles that, that will use that, they can handle that compared to what our bodies are like. Okay, so when you see ammonia, urea, uric acid, make sure you know ammonia is the most toxic, uric acid is the least toxic, and that fish 
will use ammonia because they're in watery surroundings that can dilute down that toxicity. We use urea as our excretion waste because it's a nice balance of low water loss and low energy. And uric acid is used more by things such as birds, but that one, even though it's not toxic, it does require a lot of energy to produce. So that's why we don't use that one in our bodies. Now there are various excretory organs. So for us, we think of our urinary system, but for invertebrates, so that's things like worms uh, and insects, they use certain tubular excretory organs such as flame cells, nephridia, and malpighian tubes. Now, when you see the term tubular excretory organs, that basically means a series of tubes that regulate water-salt balance, okay, water-salt balance in the body. And think about it, you know, why is it so important to remove things like salt from your body? Well, yes, you need electrolytes and salt to help your cells function, but if you start having too much accumulate within your body, that's going to throw off your osmotic pressure, meaning that your water movement from cells will be out of balance. You don't want cells either swelling up or shrinking down. So you need to be able to regulate the water salt balance in the body. Now, we could go into the mechanisms of flame cells, nephridium, malpighian tubes, but I don't think that that's significant for our purposes. Uh, you know, in, in general biology. So I just want you to know that flame cells, nephridia, malpighian tubes, they're all examples of excretory organs in invertebrates. And know that flame cells are associated with planaria, which are the flat worms that you see here. Nephridia are the excretory organs of earthworms. And malpighian tubes, that's in insects such as bees, that's what they would use for excretion. But now we want to focus a little more in terms of terrestrial excretion because we're heading toward humans. Now, want to point out that, you know, terrestrial organisms, they're losing water through excretion and respiration because when we went through cellular respiration or even when you think of your own respiring in your body, you're releasing some water part particles. So what must they do in order to balance this out? Well, terrestrial organisms, we have to drink water to balance the loss of you know, any kind of water through excretion and respiration. And we develop adaptations in order to kind of maintain our water amount, okay? If you get dehydrated, what do you do? You try and hold on to water in your body. If you're overly hydrated, what do you do? You try to excrete it out, okay? So think logically when you think about you know, what you do in terms of osmotic balance, your water salt balance. Now, what's important when we talk about excretion is how do we handle excretion? Because, you know, that's the significant system. Who cares about the planaria, the worms and the bees? We want to know what do humans need and do? So for our excretory system, you have two kidneys. Okay, unless you've had any kind of surgery or donations. Now, with your two kidneys, you'll notice in pictures, there's always this little beige or yellowish glob on top. That glob is your adrenal gland. So here is one adrenal gland, here's another adrenal gland. So we say adrenal glands, plural, that you have. Now, your kidneys, they're essential in your homeostatic functions, basically your regulation of electrolytes that we keep mentioning, your balance of acid base, your, your pH balance in your blood, in your body, and even the regulation of blood pressure, okay? because they, your kidneys, they maintain salt and water balance. And think about it, that impacts your blood pressure because when you have more water 
in your body, you have more volume to your blood. When you have salt, what does that do? When you, when you eat a lot of salt, that pumps that blood pressure up, right? So water salt balance, maintaining that, the kidneys technically even regulate your blood pressure. And of course, they serve the, uh, as the body's you know, natural filter and, and removing waste through your body, which is very significant, very important. Okay, and we'll keep coming back to the, the purposes of the kidneys. But for now, make sure you understand that as we go through the human excretory system, it's very important because it involves regulation of electrolytes, your pH balance in your blood, even regulating your blood pressure and filtering out waste that are then excreted through urine. Now, when we talk about the kidneys, there are first three layers of external connective tissue. There's your renal fascia, okay? So you have your outer layer, which is the renal fascia. You then have perirenal fat capsule and a renal capsule. And then the internal portion of the kidneys, the internal region, is broken down into the renal cortex, which is the outermost layer, and then the re renal medulla, so think medulla middle, and then the renal pelvis, which is the inner portion near where you'll find the arteries and veins for that, that kidney. Okay. Now, with this, we want to also Pay attention to the fact that each kidney is connected to a ureter, okay? And what I want you to do is look at how I underlined ureter because I want you to think bladder because the ureter, the purpose of that is that it conducts urine from the kidneys to your bladder. Then the urine is excreted through the urethra, and for urethra, I always underline RA and think ran right out my body, okay? Urethra, the purpose of that is to be a tube between your bladder and the exit of your body. So your urethra is the exit of your body for the excretion of urine, okay? So ran right out your body. Now, your kidneys are also composed of a whole bunch of tubules, which we call nephrons. So anytime you hear nephrons, neph, renal, any of that is referring to kidneys. Now, your nephrons, the purpose of those is to remove waste products from the body and to produce urine, okay, to remove waste products and to to produce urine. And as you can see here, your kidney is composed of a whole bunch of different tubules and structures. They include the glomerulus, which you see here, which we're gonna talk about in upcoming slides when we go through the process of excretion. But here you see it filters small solutes from the blood, okay, things like salts and nutrients. And then you have the proximal convoluted tubule, which will be involved in the reabsorption of certain things that you want to stay back in your blood, right? You don't want to excrete them. Then you have this loop of Henle, which will have the, um, the ascending and the descending sides. So descending means dropping, ascending means going up, and that'll be involved in water passing and reabsorption of some electrolytes. You then have the distal convoluted tube, which is up here, and that will be for secretion and absorption of certain ions, which is involved in you know, pH and electrolyte balance. And then the collecting duct and the final excretion of you know, any kind of waste products. Now, when you look through all of those structures, the glomerulus and the various tubes, and then finally the collecting tubes, ultimately there's a lot that goes on in your body with regard to blood filtration and urine production. And this process involves three main processes. 
Okay, it involves glomerular filtration, tubular reabsorption, and tubular secretion. Okay, so basically what happens is first your nephrons are going to filter blood in that glomerulus, that, that tuft of capillaries that we saw in the first in, in the previous slide, that round structure within the kidneys. And with that, you know, if, if you think of most solutes picturing salts and nutrients, most solutes are going to be filtered out of the blood into that glomerulus through the process of glomerular filtration. So you're getting solutes into the glomerulus, into the kidneys, out of the blood. Now, fun fact, if you ever get blood work and you see the term EGFR, or GFR, what that stands for is glomerular filtration rate. Okay, so write that down in blood work, your GFR, your glomerular filtration rate. That's a measure of the function of kidneys. It's measuring the level of creatinine in your blood, and it uses that you know result to kind of reflect how the kidneys are functioning. How are they are they properly filtering solutes as they're supposed to be. Okay, so when you see GFR or EGFR, it's a rate of this step, glomerular filtration. Okay, after that, the filtrate, so those solutes that have been pulled into the glomerulus, they then move into the renal tubes, the kidney tubes, and most of the solutes then actually get reabsorbed. Okay, and they get reabsorbed by the process of tubular reabsorption. No, they're very clever with their names, right? So what happens is in the loop of Henle that we saw in the previous slide, the filtrate then continues to exchange solutes, so salts, as well as water with the surrounding structures. And so that your body can then reabsorb any water that it might need, because you only really want to excrete wastes. You don't want to lose too much water if you need it at that time, or too many important ions or nutrients. So you have this reabsorption stage, and then any additional solutes, you know, excess solutes, wastes, then get secreted into the final tubules in tubular uh, secretion. So it's the opposite process of tubular reabsorption. Now I know it's confusing having both occurring, but you can think of it as tubular reabsorption is basically when your body wants to try and reabsorb, it's its last chance to grab any of the nutrients or water that it needs. And then tubular secretion is, okay, let's secrete or get rid of any of the excess solutes that we don't need and any of the waste that we may have in our blood in our body okay so let's secrete that and what happens at the end of this process is your collecting ducts will do exactly as their name suggests and they'll collect the filtrate coming from your nephrons Okay. And from there, you basically now have filtrate that is called urine that will eventually go to the ure ureters and then to your urethra and exit your body. So here you have out the collecting duct, you have any of the final wastes or uh, products that you need to excrete. Okay, so it started with filtering in the glomerulus, grabbing from the blood any of the solutes and water and nutrients, etc., then reabsorbing what it needs and secreting out the wastes. Since that was a lot of information, here is a recap slide for you to jot down some notes. Now, as we kind of touched upon already multiple times, even though you're thinking of the kidneys in terms of excretion, they're not just for excreting and getting urine out of the body. They're very important in your homeostasis, meaning the balance in your body. They're important for multiple reasons. One of them is, like we've been saying, to excrete 
metabolic waste. So first function is excrete metabolic waste. Then write down that the second function that we've been talking about is to maintain the water salt balance in your body. So maintain osmotic pressure. In addition to that, they also maintain the acid base balance, meaning the pH of your blood, okay? By modifying, you know, the waste, pulling the waste out and properly regulating everything else, they're, they're maintaining acid base balance. And lastly, they secrete hormones and basically help regulate metabolic functions in your body, okay? So they even, like we said before, they're involved in regulating your blood pressure through all of this work that they're doing. So over here, you see this little kidney guy is very important. There's a lot of hormones and chemicals that ends up being involved in a lot of your other systems, okay? And in terms of really regulating your body and making sure everything is going well. So we're going to start mentioning some of those hormones and some of that balance that occurs. In case you missed any of that or you want to make sure you have correct spellings, here are your recap notes. So there's a lot of different hormones when we talk about kidneys and their functions in homeostasis and osmoregulation. So first off, we're going to point out excretion of urine is basically dependent on reabsorption of water throughout that process that we were talking about. Now, water travels through what are called aquaporins. And in your body, you have what's called an antidiuretic hormone. Another name that you sometimes see that as is vasopressin. Okay, you don't have to uh, know that term, but no ADH, antidiuretic. Now, when you think about diuretics, things like coffee, like tea, what do they do? They make you pee, right? So antidiuretic, what would that do? It would do the opposite, okay? Less pee, less water to release. So antidiuretic hormone, that's a hormone that helps your kidneys manage the amount of water in your body, okay? It causes less water to be released. It's basically what it does is it helps increase the amount of water absorbed in your body and decrease the amount of urine produced, okay? So when you think of ADH, make sure you know that it helps increase the amount of water absorbed, so you're keeping in more water, and decrease the amount of urine produced, so you're peeing out less water. It also, to help hold on to that water, will decrease your sweating. Now think about it. If you now have more water that you're keeping in your body, you're increasing your blood pressure, you're increasing the amount of water pushing through all of your veins and arteries. So that's why we were saying that things like the kidneys and, and, and this osmoregulation can affect your blood pressure as well because water volume is what determines how much blood you have in your veins, in your arteries, okay? So when you think about ADH, I want you to know the difference between what happens when your body is dehydrated versus overhydrated. So think about it. If you have dehydration, you want to retain every drop of the water that you have in your body. You want to hold on to it. What would help you hold on to that? ADH, right? Antidiuretic hormone. So your body will release more ADH when you are dehydrated. Whereas during times of overhydration, well, what does overhydration mean? You have tons of water, extra water. So do you wanna hold on to every bit of water? No, you have tons of water coming in available. You can just let it go, bro, right? Let that water go. And what will let it go? Diuretics, right? So in that case, ADH, an antidiuretic, is inhibited. You don't want it when you're overhydrated. You want to let the water out. 
because you're getting too much water. Okay, so dehydration, ADH is released and you want to hold on to water. Overhydration, ADH is inhibited. You want to get rid of that water. Since that, since that last slide had a lot of information on ADH, I typed out almost word for word what I was saying, basically like closed captioning for you to jot down any notes. So you can pause and take some notes. Now some other, now some other uh, hormones that you may have heard of already involved in regulation are epinephrine and norepinephrine, okay? Now, when you think of these, we usually think of them as the flight or fight hormones, or sometimes people say it in reverse, the fight or flight hormones, okay? That's because they're released under extreme stress, basically, whenever you're taking one of my tests, for instance, okay? Now, with epinephrine and norepinephrine, epinephrine is released by your adrenal medulla, okay, your adrenal glands. Norepinephrine is released by the nervous system directly. Okay? Now, when we say these are your fight or flight hormones, think about it. During stress, right, you want energy put toward either fighting the current danger or running away from it. Everything else at that moment is not important or not as important as either fighting that danger or getting away from it. So you want all of your energy put toward that. So kidney function is halted temporarily during stressful conditions, during extreme stress. And it's halted by epinephrine and norepinephrine. They both act directly on smooth muscles of blood vessels to cause the blood vessels to constrict which means vasoconstriction, right? So they're vasoconstrictors. Now, once your blood vessels are constrict or constricted, that blood flow into the nephrons, into your kidneys is going to stop, okay? So the hormones are basically trying to get all of the energy put toward fight or flight and to kind of hold off on your other regulation, your other metabolic processes. So these vasoconstrictors, they constrict the blood flow away from the kidneys. Now these hormones then go one step further and they trigger what's called the renin, angiotensin, and aldosterone system. And what that does, what you see here, is that's an important regulator of water salt balance as well as blood pressure. So what happens in this pathway? The enzyme renin changes angiotensinogen, which is a precursor, into angiotensin 1 and then conversion into angiotensin 2. Now angiotensin is important because this will stimulate your adrenal glands to then release aldosterone. And what does aldosterone do? It triggers the release of ADH, okay? ADH is going to be released from your hypothalamus, and we already know ADH is antidiuretic hormone, right? Anti-peeing water out, you can think of it as. So ADH will lead to water retention in the kidneys. Now that aldosterone, released from the adrenals. It's also a hormone that promotes secretion of potassium ions and the reabsorption of sodium ions, okay? So it's basically involved in reabsorption of electrolytes, of salts, which will also increase reabsorption of water as well. So it's involved in helping to absorb water and electrolytes. And when you have more absorption of water, that will increase your blood volume and blood pressure, just like we've been saying all along. Okay, so ADH and aldosterone, they're helping you hold on to or absorb more water. Now patients, if you ever hear patients who have Addison's disease, what Addison's disease is they have a failing uh, adrenal cortex 
So their adrenal cortex cannot properly produce and secrete aldosterone. So they'll have trouble regulating this blood volume, regulating blood pressure, and um, properly absorbing some of their electrolytes and water. Now, this pathway, which is very important in terms of regulating your blood pressure, the renin, angiotensin, aldosterone pathway, which we keep relating to blood pressure, blood volume, there are some other hormones or enzymes that will control the pathway. One of them is ANH. Sometimes you'll see it as ANP. So for instance, the textbook we have this semester, I believe shows it as ANP, but other places you hear it as ANH. What that stands for is atrial natriuretic peptide or atrial natriuretic hormone. It basically promotes the excretion of salts thus also promoting a decrease in blood volume and blood pressure because it's getting rid of a lot of salt from your cells and your, your blood and your body. So if you are decreasing the amount of salt, you're reducing salt, then you're also lowering blood pressure. And it basically, when you think of blood volume, blood pressure, it's not only salt and water content dependent, it's also based on are your blood vessels constricted or are they dilated? So constricted will increase your blood pressure, whereas dilated will decrease it. So any hormone or peptide that we're saying is decreasing your blood pressure, it means that it's acting also as a vasodilator. Okay, so you see this a lot being um, a hormone released by cells in your atrium that you know the the atria of your heart in response to high blood pressure and we also see it in patients with sleep apnea but basically the point of a and h is it's released by your cells because they detect high blood pressure and they want to lower it down you also have angiotensin converting enzyme or ace ACE is also involved in controlling this renin angiotensin aldosterone pathway because ACE converts angiotensin 1 to angiotensin 2. And remember, we said angiotensin 2, that raises blood pressure. So where do you hear about ACE? Well, medically, you hear ACE inhibitors, right? Because if angiotensin II is something that raises blood pressure, then medically, if someone has high blood pressure, you're going to want to inhibit ACE, right? Block that raise in blood pressure. So ACE inhibitors, when you hear that in the medical field, that is regulating or controlling blood pressure. It's lowering your blood pressure by blocking or inhibiting ACE, angiotensin converting enzyme. So you use it to treat high blood pressure and heart failure because if angiotensin vasoconstricts, this will inhibit, the ACE inhibitors will inhibit that so it will loosen or dilate or open up the blood vessels and reduce that pumping pressure, that force, okay? So always ask yourself, is you know something increasing blood pressure? Is it decreasing it? How do you block it? That's where all of these terms end up connected. Now we mentioned that in addition to everything else this system is doing, it also maintains your acid-base balance too. Now we've mentioned acid-base or pH balance of blood way back when. Uh, we mentioned that pH of blood is balanced or controlled by bicarbonate ions. So remember bicarbonate buffers. Also hydrogen ions are usually involved in this as well. So when you hear of maintaining acid-base balance in the blood, I want you to think of the bicarbonate buffer system. Basically, the reabsorption of bicarbonate ions in your blood will decrease acidity, 
because these bicarbonate ions can bind to hydrogen ions. And if you think of pH, well, acids, we said acidity was high concentration of H plus ions, hydrogen ions. So bicarbonate will cancel that out. You also have excretion of carbon dioxide from your lungs. And when carbon dioxide is excreted, hydrogen ions end up bound in water. And that changes the pH because again, hydrogen ions make things acidic. So by binding them up, you're decreasing that acidity. Okay, removal of hydrogen ions balances or, or buffers the system. And that is it for excretion, osmoregulation, all that fun stuff. If you have any questions, as always, send me a message in Remind, okay? Have a great day.